Do you like donuts? Do you like donuts? Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast on Big Z, and I am on location at Deviant Race Parts here in Northern Idaho with Chad Hall, uh, the, the man, the myth, the legend of Deviant Race Parts and many other businesses. A few, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, last time we talked, we were in San Hollow National Park in yeah. Utah. We were in the front seat of, uh, are we in the, we were in, uh, <laughs> we were in, in, in Brent's in Brent, uh, Brent, Brent, Orange uh, Crush. Orange Crush, yeah, that was that fun. Was that fun. was a good time. <laughs> I had, yeah. a lot, had a lot of people say that was a, that was a fun episode, so. Uh, we talked a lot about you know the company and the history and all that uh, during that episode. Uh, we were in the middle of a UTV takeover event. Um, how was that event for you guys? I mean, that was like your first. Um, that was our first true UTV event. We we've been to a lot of events in, with this company, but it, in other you know the diesel side, um, and that event. Uh, was off the chain, man. That was one of the coolest events I've ever been to. Everybody was super nice there. Um, a lot of people like showing up to ride and having yeah, a good time. Yeah, and that and that's all what this is about. Like, you know, we didn't get into this because we didn't like to ride, or you know, it was about money. It was about let's do something that you know we can you know make a few bucks, but also like be passionate about. Be passionate about. You know, we like we've been riding UTVs since they came out, and. You know, something that we knew we could do and, right. and, and we love doing it. So, so I was out, out back and you have a few units out there. Not all of them are your guys's. That's correct. Um, yeah. But uh, it kind of gives a history on the cars you guys have had over the years that you were talking about maybe some of the 900s you used to have. And yeah. So I had, remember I was going to, I went to St. Anthony uh, in 2011 and um, I had quad then, you know, and, and just like I was getting beat up and I was done. And I uh, went over to Rexburg Motorsports and they had a XP 900 sitting in the showroom. And I'm like, I'll take it. Yeah. And so we had to figure out how to get everything back after that because uh, <laughs> not everything fit. I, yeah, shoot. Well, those you, shoot. you can just pop into the back of the truck, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Unless so yours that, was like five feet off the ground like the rest of them. No, it was, it was, <laughs> it was fun though. So that was kind of like my initial foray into like the side-by-sides and, and, Realize, you know, with uh, with age comes a cage, and and um, I think I realize which is not a bad thing, by the way. Everyone no. downplays that, but I'm pretty comfortable with that idea. So I kind of, I kind of, you know, I have, I have three kids. At the time, I had two kids, and and you know, it was kind of important to me to have something protecting me more than just my helmet, you yeah. know. And then as soon as I found out how fun they were, you know, that car, geez, we must have put 3,500 miles on it. It went through every suspension component one of my guys <laughs> wrecked it uh at at uh saint anthony That's pretty bad like actually broke his back oh wow yeah he broke his back we ended up having to uh i had to drive him home all the way from rexburg all the way to here all the way up here yeah they wow. they said he was too big to fit in his machines he was a pretty pretty big fella oh and um and so i ended up having to drive him back and he was in a turtle brace for he, he's passed quite a now. while yeah, he passed on about uh, two years ago, but oh. really, really nice guy. And he worked, he worked for me for many years and, yeah. and um, was a, just a, a good cat. He went on the road with me and did a bunch of stuff. So it's funny you say that about the, the 900 going through all the suspension components and everything. It seems to be the storyline of the 900s mm -hmm. that like, for whatever reason, those motors were pretty rock solid. It was just oh, yeah. everything that was around them everything. that had to get replaced. Yeah, everything. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that car went through a lot of iterations. We learned a lot on that car just from, you know, me, myself personally. Yeah. You know, what works, what doesn't work. And, and um, that was kind of like, I wouldn't say that was the start of us starting this, you know, uh, four, four years ago or so. But um, it, it did give me a good indication of, you know, these machines kind of outperform their underpinnings. Did you go straight from a 900 into the thousand or did you go straight up to a turbo? I went right to a turbo. Right yeah, to the turbo. Yeah, I had the, I had, uh, I had like the a 900, 16. went to the 16, which is actually still in the fleet. Uh, Chris Roscoe that works here has it. It's on tracks right now. Yeah, I saw that back there, fully enclosed. And fully enclosed, yeah, and it's heated and um, he goes out riding all the way up in the Northwest here and they just have a blast. Yeah, and those so, two seaters on tracks, they're they're pretty awesome up in the Oh, snow. it's super capable and, and uh, he really likes, he just kind of likes that style riding and then yeah. they go out uh, they've been doing a little bit of uh, hunting too while they've been oh. out so cool yeah it's been nice but so you went into a turbo uh how long did you run that and, and so i had the <laughs> so i had the 16 i bought it it was brand new 
Um, we did, you know, did a, a mild build on it, and then one of my employees that is no longer here stole it and <laughs> wrecked it. Wow! From, from right behind the shop, it was sitting behind the shop, and and uh, he took it out and rallied it in front of the shop. And um, I was on the boat that afternoon, and I got a call at like six o'clock. Hey, the cops are at the shop. Wow! And uh, nothing like going out with yeah, a bang. Yeah, so he did. <laughs> And that was that was kind of a bad deal. So that we had to rebuild it after that. It had to get a new frame put under it. Um, they didn't total it out for some reason, but um, put you a had new to frame. do a whole frame and yeah, a whole new frame it? didn't total it because it was only like two weeks old. So hmm. I don't know. They didn't total it. Put a new frame under it, and then we went through all of that. So that that car I had for I think it had twenty five hundred miles on it, all riding in here, St. Anthony. Um, and, and here, this is, we're, 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 we're in Idaho, Idaho, Northwest, Idaho, 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 Idaho. So, yeah, if anybody's in North, North Idaho, there's trails here that you can ride from the Canadian border into Montana, into Washington State. Yeah, and as we yeah, know, all the way out yeah. in Nevada. So. Yeah, so it's, yeah, <laughs> the, you could. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a cool spot to, to ride, and our riding style is a lot different here. Um, so the, that's, that was a really good machine for us for the trails that we do, the, the 64 wide. Um, I love that car. Yeah. It's a great car, but then the Turbo S came out, and I was like, I have to have one. And right. then had a kid. <laughs> wanted a four seater, you know, so we did the bill on that. That car proved itself really, really well. Um, had that has been at all the dunes, been down to San Hollow when we did the, the, uh, the event and then um, did a bunch of rock crawling with it and, and parts held up amazing and, and really like it. So, but then it was time for the pro. So, time so, to so out back of the shop, he's got a brand new four seater pro yeah. R yep. a launch edition, bright lime. Oh man. <laughs> Wasn't my choice, but it was what was available. <laughs> that's a, yeah. that's a roll through North Idaho oh, uh, man. magnet for some, some comments. <laughs> it is very, it is very bright. But I was the one was available. Yeah, yeah, you gotta so get what you can I just take, had to so. had to pick up. You know, we wanted to get one as soon as we could, and and I missed the order time, order slot to get one soon enough, and they just happened to have one at Wenatchee Power Sports. So gotcha. So you went down there, there and, yeah. and picked one up. So you haven't really got a chance to to rally in it yet, but uh, you guys are are full bore straight into development. How's that? Like what? I talked to you earlier about maybe kind of getting your opinion on the mindset of development on these machines, but just seeing that car and getting it in the shop, what was your first impression of the suspension and the things that you as a company would, would fabricate for that vehicle? What was your first impressions? I mean, it, when you look at it, in theory, it's, it looks like it's a really strong car. It's got really big A arms on it. Their control arms got the radius rods are, you know, inch and a half. It's like, it, it looks from outward appearances to be really strong. And as we've known over the last few months, have they been out? There have been some failures. So right. the stamp steel control arms just don't, they're, they're not built for the kind of abuse that we're going to put it through. They might have, you know, allowed that to go through testing, but. They're a good so, starting point. Yeah, they are a good starting point. And for, for I'd say 80% 80, 80 of the riders are going to use them. They're probably never have to replace it, but then there's going to be the guys that go out and ride them like we do. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we've already started. We just took the front shocks off. We're going to do uh, a billet shock fork for that, that's the first thing we got. Chris is actually drawing one in the back uh, today as we speak. Um, and then uh, we'll get right into doing lowers, fabricated lowers, fabricated uppers. Um, and uh, as we've seen on, on the channel, the radius rods are definitely something to look at. So. Yeah, and we were just talking to our machinist about, about uh, building, or building built radius rods for it just right. a minute ago, right before, right before uh, we got on air. So yeah, yeah so that'll be, those, that'll be the, the immediate right off the bat will be radius rods and control arms um sway bar end links uh, rock sliders you know new bumper ideas roll cage that car's gonna have a full build hopefully before oregon that's kind of the that's kind of the goal so so you only got a couple months uh, to really start getting things in the machines yeah. and and going yeah um you know when it when it comes down to developing a new set of products for these what's your first kind of like idea is it just make something that fits and see how it works? Or do you guys go through a process of like, I don't know, kind of replicating the design elements that are there and then putting your own twist on it? That's, we, we kind of take a creative approach, but we also take a, a logical approach to, to building parts. So obviously they have to fit, but the second side is they have to, they have to hold up to the abuse that we know people put them through. And it's not just, you know, we can't just build a, uh, a suspension component that works for a desert guy or a guy that rides the dunes. We also have to build it for, you know, East Coast guys and the way that they ride, which is completely different than, than West Coast guys, the rock crawlers. So they have to be, you know, so we have to 
build them to take the abuse of multiple riding conditions. And something that people don't really consider on these new cars, the, the Pro R and, and probably the Turbo R to some extent, is that we're no longer talking about you know a 1600 pound two-seater no we're talking about a 24 2800 pound Correct. car yep. uh with a lot of that weight being in the back yeah whereas you know in, in the the current lineup of xps most of the weight's pretty well balanced mm -hmm. um but with these new cars not only are you going faster creating more front impact correct you're also throwing the back end around a lot yep. harder which has a lot more weight behind it yep. so you have a lot more mass and 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 energy going into those components so you know, we, we were we were looking at some components for, for our Razor yep. that are 120 wall, um, super beefy. Uh, does that trigger anything in your head of like the materials themselves, maybe thinking about uh, beefier components, yep. like thicker, thicker yeah. walls or solid versus yep. hollow, things yep. like that? Uh, we'll never do a solid uh, round tube. It'll, all, it'll just be a thicker wall if we do decide to do that. Um, in most cases, I don't think if we did any sort of a tubular design that it, it, that it would have any arch, it would just be a straight. Right. Um, just because of the length of that of that radius rod is so it's big. It's a very wide it car. Is, it's a wide car. And like you were saying earlier, the, the mount points for the radius arms are further narrow. Inboard, yeah. Uh, and, and they go deeper into the pockets on the knuckles. Yep. Uh, and so you do have quite a bit more length. You just don't really see it necessarily. Correct. Yep. Um, so they are quite a bit longer I mean, than a standard XP or even a Turbo S. Yeah, I mean, I was telling you earlier, you know, a, a radius rod for a Turbo S is two inches shorter than this one on, e on each side. So right. that's just an additional strain that goes onto that component. So right. um, I think the first iteration of this one is going to be a billet. Uh, radius rods, uh, fairly well built, thick. It's going to be adjustable at one end. I know on the bottom we're talking about uh, how we're going to design that. That's still in the process all next week right. when we actually get the car completely torn apart. Tore down. Yeah, because I can't really decide which way I want to do it. Then go through strength testing and go through all of the, the normal engineering that we have to do here. And then, you know, back into an R&D, you know, car that this car will get used, abused. Right. And then once we feel comfortable enough with that part, it goes out to the public. So right. we try to do as much testing beforehand so we're not making you guys do it, you know? Like, right. I don't want to set a part out that we think is going to work and then fails. Right. It's the greatest way to lose a business, so, <laughs> you know. So, so one of the things that uh, we touched on a little bit earlier today uh, was, you know, sourcing materials for these, for these components and, and all that. Uh, over the last, I mean, we talked a little bit in uh, the, the last podcast we were on about sourcing materials and, and kind of how the strain of the current pandemic thing and everything else was going on over the last you know eight months or whatever it's been since you know we kind of went over that stuff has it gotten better worse has it been staying the same like um it has gotten it's about the same uh, we're still there's still you know price increases that are happening every every day sometimes daily basis we're getting price increases um you know we are having to order more material at at, at, a, at a given time so that we know that we have enough material to fulfill orders and, and until your next yeah, stock until supply. our next stock supply um it, you know anything that we're that we're doing here we're yeah we're buying substantially more material to to keep in stock so that we're not waiting um i would say it's about the same as it was five months ago there's really hasn't been much change except for price right yeah and and you're one of the companies that have chosen to to try to try to not pass on that that price increase over this this period right and um i know for a lot of small fabs and shops that are working on a lot of this stuff um we see we see some people really kind of hiking it up based off of what their percentage increase is yeah uh, we see a lot of dealers that are taking advantage of the market right now and doing a lot of you know gouging to customers and things like that and i think that's an important discussion that people um yeah, we've been having on our channel but just in in general in the community um, people are starting to get a little fed up with on the the moral of of these businesses taking advantage of the community's predicament right. um, and so when we talk about pricing a product um, there's there's a lot more than just the cost of goods that goes into these things and, and you have a strategic business plan to make sure you're a viable business and yep. they can support your employees yep. um, and you know you don't you don't penny pinch your employees here yeah. like uh so there, there's a whole different business mindset when you go into an ethos of putting out a good product with treating your employees well and treating the community well 
and um, have margins on top of and it. have margins yeah, on top still have of to it. pay the bills and eat and, and feed these families and right. you know all those things i mean we have been doing as good of a job as possible to source additional materials to get a bigger price break to you know to kind of eat but we have been eating a lot of costs over the last really since the pandemic right you know and um it does hurt but we're also realizing that that everybody else is on now on a on a budget with this inflation that's going on you know um if they didn't get a 10 percent raise they've lost money right you know what i mean and, and right. i know a lot of businesses including myself have increased wages and, and done that stuff over the course of the pandemic which also eats into profit margins this is the stuff that you guys don't like to hear but we you know we have no, to, it's we important have, to talk we about to, it we have to make money to to be a viable business and to support the, the, the industry for the, as long as you know the possible. the weird thing is that people have a mindset that if a company sells something to you they're making a bunch of money oh yeah. and and why can't I get it cheaper? And so one of the biggest um, things I hate about uh, the way that we as a community sometimes shop is we go on Facebook and we say, who has the cheapest price on this part? Yeah, and then right? it becomes a fight. And then mm -hmm. it becomes this big long thread. Yeah. And there's some guys that, that try their best to mitigate that conversation, but I think we as a community need to have a better conversation about um, maybe not necessarily who has the cheapest price. And, and you know, there's times and places to do thriftful shopping sure, absolutely um you know on consumable parts that are just you know shipped overseas or whatever there's there's it's okay to try to get the best price on something sure. like that but yeah um when we're talking about you know hard components that are going to be on your car for a long time and provide you a safety factor and an enjoyment factor and a reliability factor um you know we shouldn't be so fast to penny pinch every single part and every single purchase we should be looking for what components are going to do the best for my situation yep. and solve my needs and keep my family safe. Uh, and I'm willing to pay that because that's important. Right. And I, I, it happens on a daily basis. I think, you know, you get, you know, you see that on the, on the forums or on a, a, a some sort of a social page of the cheapest price or, you know, and then you've got 10 guys that are rushing to, to, you know, to make that sale. Um, and it's really a disservice. You don't walk into Walmart and ask them for a bigger discount on the, on the supplies you're getting at Walmart. You know what I mean? And, and I think as an industry, it's just been the commonplace to be like, well, give me a package deal or, you know, and not to say that we don't, we are, haven't done that. You know what I mean? But it does affect the margins. It does affect the quality of work that goes into stuff. Stuff has to get produced faster. Stuff has to get produced cheaper. Um, and we don't like that. I mean, it's not, it's not that I don't like to price things appropriately or to be a fair market value. Um, and, and I'd say we're pretty fair market for what we do. We try to keep our cost as, as low as we possibly can while still making a tangible profit. You right. know what I mean? And, and um, Well, and even just like the dealers, you know, there's a lot of dealers that have resorted to this um, desperation mentality of jumping into these threads and stuff like that. Like, just whatever it takes to get the sale. Yeah. DM me. I'll give you the best deal. You right. Know? Yeah. And, and I think that's a disservice to their business because if we're not able to provide the margins, they're not going to be healthy and grow. No. And if they're going for the, the bottom dollar sale, I see that more of a bad business practice than, a, than you know, an actual sale. You know, I've, I've, I've been in business since 2005 in a variety of businesses. And one thing that, one thing that I started out on was it was never about how much money I can make. It's never been about, about the, the end all profitability or, or any, you know, of course we've got to be profitable. Of course we have to make money, but I always felt like if I ran a business fair and treated people appropriately and provided a good product and service that the money would come at some point, you know what I mean? And so it's never, for me, it's never been about how much it's always been about if I can provide the best things and give them what they need, then they're going to tell their friends and, you know, uh, just right. the ball keeps rolling. And so, and I would think almost any good business owner that I know is treats their business about the same way. They, it's never been about the end dollar. It's always been about making their business good and, and having, you know, an appropriate profit margin to keep you, keep your ability to grow. Well, and there's a lot of that that's about keeping people happy, right? You, you want to keep yourself happy with a good income. Yep. You want to keep the customer happy with a good product. You want to keep your employees happy with yep. a good place to work. And a lot of that comes from a good mental place of running your business. And, and being desperate to the bottom dollar is a tactic that 
we see big companies do yep. where they just have a fleet of sales guys just trying to make the sales because they're trying to hit their quotas yep. or whatever. Yep. Um, and it never makes for a good place. Those people always want to quit their jobs. Yep. Those places don't ever have a good quality product because yep. they're always doing a bottom margin dollar product. Yep. Um, and so we, our industry is under a, a unique time where it's growing fast. We have a lot of new blood in our industry, uh, consumer wise. Um, we have a lot of consolidation on the business side. Yeah, you're right. A lot and, of business has been bought out. And so what we're going to end up seeing is a big influx of the market being told what to do and what to buy right. and the consumer market willing to throw money at it with no understanding of the repercussions right. of giving in to that kind of um, uh, industry. Um, I don't know. I don't want to call it manipulation, but um, just structuring, right? Well, a big company that comes in, they're going to want to, you know, immediately any any big company that comes in is going to cut costs. Like right? mm -hmm. they're they're going to try to get down to the as most of those companies that get purchased are purchased by uh, big institutional investors. You know, groups like and investment groups are almost yeah. the worst because well, they're, they're just worried about the bottom dollar. They're not worried about anything else. And right. so you know, to try to keep any sort of culture inside of a business when that's all they're worried about is right. really hard. And it's important for me to keep a culture here where I can walk out and still have a relationship with my employees um, and not have them feel like they can't come and talk to me about stuff. Right. You know? And there's, there's been a recent number of um, UTV shops around the Northwest that have closed shop recently. Um, and there's, there's reasons why they close, but for the most part, you know, it's that internal culture that's degraded over time because right. the business practices themselves weren't uh, up to snuff, right? Right. And they weren't ethically based around some of these ideas. Um, and when we start looking at corporate conglomerations, consolidating businesses and practices and sales teams and uh, supply chains and manufacturing and all this other stuff, right? It becomes more robotic on their side. They lose their culture. Those right. brands start losing their community tie-ins. Um, and then the community is left to fend for itself, you know, where it had these other supportive groups. Um, and we have so much new blood in our industry that they don't realize that our culture, our, our industry really grew out of this culture of people getting Absolutely. These, building these machines to do stuff they weren't meant to do. Right. You know, building these rhinos to go off jumps. And, yep. Um, you know, all these little machines that were just farm utility vehicles. Yeah, that are doing way crazy things. They throw sand paddles on them, they're going, you know. Right. Riding Glamis and Dumont and, you know, places like that where you're, they were no, never intended to be. They were right. farm, farm utility vehicles, you know. But it was that community that built the industry. And, I mean, there's obviously industry leaders like Polaris and, and Can-Am and, and all these different companies that have built these machines to be what they are, yeah. and they've pushed our innovation forward and, and, and brought us cool stuff like the Pro-R mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, put millions and millions of dollars behind it. But ultimately, they, have, they don't have anyone to sell to unless the community is there to, to back it up. Correct. And, and I, one of the concerns I had recently was just our lack of awareness of what's going on in the industry. And so recently, we've seen some buyouts in the shock industry. Mm -hmm. We've seen some consolidation in a number of different, even just like in the whips game, mm -hmm. like some whip mm -hmm. companies were bought out. Like we're, we're starting to see some of the uh, original small businesses in our industry getting swallowed up by bigger businesses. Yeah. And maybe not even the titans, but just yep. just the actual progression of business being bought by business. Um, and I think it's important that we as an indus industry community recognize that and, and support the, the businesses like the mom and pop shops, let them have their margin. Yep. If they want to throw you a good deal on, you know, take tax off or do something like, cool, like that's a relationship between you and them. They, they like you enough to do that. You right. trust them enough that they're not going to lose money on the deal. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a lot of shops online that are pushing, you know, China made product that is yep. coming overseas in bulk. And there, there's a place for that. People's budgets all determine what they're going to buy and, and from who. But I think one of my focuses recently, and, and I'll be coming out with a lot of content on this um, soon, hopefully, uh, but is to really push the idea that we need to support our industry internally. I, it's been my, that has been my focus since kind of I started Deviant in 2010, was um, that we are one, supporting American jobs, that we're supporting American mills for, for aluminum and, and, and steel, that we're supporting American fan, you know, manufacturing companies that have to bring in the additional components that we use in our kits. 
Um, you know, there's some things you can't buy in America. You just can't yeah. buy them, you know, but you know, for 99% of the parts that we put on, put out are American sourced, American made with American hands. And, right. and that, you know, you can't grow a community, one, the community you live in by outsourcing the jobs. Right. And you can't grow the community that you're trying to supply with outsourced jobs, in my right. opinion. I mean, you can bring in a bunch of cheap parts um, and you can throw a, a great warranty on it and, and you know, you're still getting a cheap part. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a, a different mentality. There's, there's, there's a mentality that says, I can make a lot of money over the next five years by doing X, Y, Z, and then I'm out. Yeah, right. The, this is definitely not a short, short pull <laughs> game for me. This is something that I, I am in for the long haul. It's just like in the community, right? We talk about this is a lifestyle, right? This yeah. is something that we believe in, not only just because it's fun to do on the weekends, but yep. because it's a, it's a mindset that we have of connecting what we do day to day with the outdoors and experiencing things that you just don't normally do in corporate yeah. America, yep. right? And some of the best friends I have are from, from within this industry, you know what right. I mean? Within this industry and the automotive in general yeah. industry, you know what I mean? And, and those are all the enthusiasts, all the guys that, that you know, are out innovating parts and, and making parts and installing those parts and using those parts and abusing those parts you know, and those, that's the type of people that I've been right. around for 20 years. And I think that there is, there's a misnomer of like, if you, if you get by, by a product and it breaks like that, that you've been wronged. Like there's, right. there's this idea that, um, you know, I'm not going to buy from this company because I bought a tie rod and it broke. Right. Well, it's like, well, let's take a little bit bigger step back on that and, and just yeah. how far were you pushing it. Right. Um, I don't think that uh, we should be so quick to judge a business based off of one single product or how you treated it. Uh, I think we need to do a better job of understanding our limitations and our, just like when someone buys a side by side for the first time and I tell yeah. them, yep. the first thing you should do is take the whole thing apart and put it back together. Mm -hmm. And then you should go on the trail and take it easy. And then right. you should go to the dunes and take it easy. Mm -hmm. And then just do some, like three months of sightseeing. Yeah. Don't even try to put the throttle down. Yeah. Maybe not even take it out of low. Like just yeah. enjoy the experience and then start progressing up so that you can understand your limits, the machine's limits, what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy. And then you can start to get a little bit more finicky on, I want this part, I want that yep. part. I want this component that, you know, provides safety, this part that provides stability or whatever the case may be. Yeah, well, it's really easy to run out of talent when you don't have any in the first place, right? Right. So. And we had a, pro I had a conversation with somebody recently about like the Pro-R. Yeah. And the fact that it's bringing such a big, capable vehicle to the market. Yeah. Uh, that has a ton of horsepower, that has a ton of weight. Yep. That has a ton of suspension travel, that has uh, a whole bunch of features that are sold to you by Polaris. Yeah. As being a bigger, beefier, stronger, faster, more capable car. And they're saying, go out to the desert and have fun. They're yeah. saying, go out to the whoops and have fun yeah. because it's not a big deal anymore because we have an awesome car. Yeah. And there's, there's, some, there's some people that are buying these cars, never even been off-road in their life, and are buying a, a, you know, a SpaceX yeah, a 200, rocket. 225 horse, <laughs> crazy amount of travel, basically a, a trophy truck on a budget. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and yeah. It, it, You'll see guys like that. I, I'm, I don't know how many places I've been to where you've seen people that are new, never even been off road, don't even own a four wheel drive vehicle, right. um, and completely water vehicle up because they just don't know the limits of, of how that vehicle is supposed to be ran. Well, and the, and the bigger part is like, our industry has been around long enough now that we have a ton of people that are able to do a Correct. lot of this. And so when pe new people go out to the dunes or go out to the trail or go to the rock crawling or the whatever, they see this guy just crawl up this face and, and like it's nothing. Yeah. Or they go on this dune and carve a big, yep. you know, roost around the top of something and come back out of it like it's nothing. Yeah. But what they're not understanding is there's another $5,000 worth of upgrades. There's another three years of driver yeah. experience. There's, yep. you know, two or three wrecked cars right. in the history of yep. that driver. Yep. There's a lot of things that come into play. Um, and so that's why I encourage people, if you buy a new car and you're going to want to be a duner, like, Find a friend that's been duning yeah, for three years and, and have them just walk you around the well, dunes. That's how I learned how to sand dune. I mean, you know, was never in the never in the in that until like early two thousands, and um, you know, got my first uh, quad and went out. And but my buddy had been riding the dunes since he was like twelve years old, and so it was it was it was a natural progression. And it was like, hey, this is you need to do this or watch out for this. Um, and then you know, we went to Sand Hollow and. 
I've never rock crawled before beyond the stuff that we do in the trails right. around here. It's a Nothing. whole different rock crawling it in just, the Northwest yeah. than it is in Utah. <laughs> I've never, I've never been, I've never done any slick rock stuff. And um, my good friend that owns uh, Revolution Off Road down in uh, by Sand Hollow there in Hurricane, um, that's he kind of grew up doing that. And right. so he was such a great teacher to me because um, I was so inexperienced in rock crawling that he was like if you do this, he spent a lot of time training me and then he was a really good trail guide. Like, hey, you need to hit this point, you see where this tire track is. Um, and that's what this industry needs is more people like that that are able to teach you how to do it appropriately without destroying your machine. I mean, we put 30, 40, now $50,000 into a brand new machine. Um, and then the upgrades and all the other things you do and the last thing you wanna do is see it destroyed. And if you have a good teacher or a good, uh, riding group that you can go with, um, you know, go do that or go find one. I mean, there are so many people in this industry that I've seen, hey, I'm looking for a riding group to go out to do something, right. you know, to go ride. And put yourself out there, man. Right. You know, find that group or find a, a group of people that, that you could surround yourself with to, to train. And it. not just the 530 club too. Like find no, the guys yeah. that, that actually ride and, mm -hmm. and push these cars mm -hmm. because they're going to be the ones that give you the best information. Yeah, the 530 but, club, they're just out to, you know, <laughs> do 530 things. There's, so. there's nothing wrong with a 530 club. It, it, it's a thing. But. Yeah, it is a thing. But, you know, if you're if you want to actually get some experience and learn how to ride, in the conditions that you're going to, it, it is really good to, to have somebody there that can help you. And that goes out to any viewer, like, hey, if you're one of those guys that's experienced, maybe stop and teach them. You know what I mean? It is right. nice to have that that hat, you know? And, and like you were saying, you know, growing up on quads and, and all that mm -hmm. stuff, right? You, you learned a certain amount of respect for the train you were on, Correct. right? And that goes, and it's different between dunes and, and mm -hmm. trail and mm -hmm. all that stuff. Like there's a whole lot of experience and knowledge that you get being so close to death on on, on four wheels or two yeah. wheels that yeah. uh, when you translate that over to a vehicle, a UTV, uh, you have a healthy respect for that. And then all of a sudden you have all these new variables in your head of weight and dimension yep. and, 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 and additional and, passengers and passengers. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a big a whole, part that's of That's a whole right? other deal, you know, making sure yep. they're buckled up or they have good five points, uh, you know, helmets if you're if you're in that those conditions or at any time. You know, right. I mean, it's always a good it's always good to be safe when you're doing it. And there was a time we went on a trail ride and we came around a corner, you know, at a healthy speed. I wasn't an unsafe speed, but a healthy speed. And we came up on a quad that was on its side mm -hmm. with uh, you know a young boy and, and a girlfriend set up on, on this quad, and he ended up just taking the corner too fast. Um, and the back end slipped out. He had a lot more mass high centered yep. on the vehicle and suspension wasn't set up to handle mm -hmm. that. And it wasn't really a two seater quad in the first yeah. place. And, uh, and and so, you know, she had messed up ankles and messed up wrists and her arms were all messed up and stuff. But um, but it, it, those lessons aren't learned by a lot of these new people in the market. No, a lot of people, a lot of these people are coming from desk jobs or from whatever in the city and they see these cool off-road adventures that people are taking yeah. and they're like, I can buy that. Oh shoot, I'm going to do that tomorrow. Like, yeah. and then they go out and have fun. And the first experience they have is, is wadding it up off of witch's eye on the dunes yeah, or coming around a corner, not knowing mm -hmm. that there could be somebody there yep. or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and that, that goes back to, Hey, if you're getting one of these, these machines, like you said, take it out, drive it slow. Don't, you know, don't go out and just mob the thing right off the bat because no. you are going to water it up and then that's going to be a bad experience and you're going to end up selling it, not, not being part of the community. It's uh, same for anything. You can have a, you can buy a boat and go boating and have a really bad right. experience and then you never want to buy a boat again. So. And I have a tinfoil hat conspiracy theory about manufacturer break-ins mm -hmm. that they're not about breaking in the vehicle. They're about keeping you alive for the first so, <laughs> month of owning that's the vehicle. A, that's a fair statement. It's a fair statement. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I just think that we as a community, I mean, I'm not saying that we don't train people. What I'm saying is I'm just scared about the influx of size in our community. Yep. The number of people on the dunes, yep. the number of people on the trails close to your home. Yep. You know, the closer to civilization you're going to be, the more people are going to be on Correct. these trails. Yep. Um, you know, a big thing recently has been hand signals. Just, yep. We say all the time in our industry, like, use hand signals. There's yep. signs everywhere. Like, yep. the Forestry Service puts hand signal signs everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, you, and you, most but of no, us know, but, but most nobody of us, does Yeah, absolutely. You know, I know that is one thing that I do. Yeah. You know, if we're out riding and I've got a group of guys and, you know, I'm, I'm always using hand signals, let people know, hey, there's three people behind me, there's two people behind me, you know, yep. that kind of stuff. And, and uh, you know, slow down and different things that 
I'm used to, but the new guys aren't. But then right. I've also given that knowledge to other people that right. have been with us to understand what those hand signals are. You and know? I'm, I'm in the middle of editing the last couple uh, episodes of our Washington BDR trail mm -hmm. that we did. And I, there's a couple clips in there where we came up um, just north of, I think it was, I think it was north of Chelan, mm -hmm. where we came across some adventure bike riders, right? And they were doing the same BDR we were, just in the opposite yeah. direction, yep. right? And I think there was four of them. Um, and, you know, we came up on each other, we slowed down, communicated with mm -hmm. our hand signals. Mm -hmm. um, and it reminded me of a situation we had, I think it was on the Idaho BDR, where we had a group of people we came up on, we all slowed down, we communicated our hand signals. You know, we being educated, we did our proper, there's this many behind yep, us yep. signal. Mm -hmm. They were telling us, everyone in their group, all the people in the group told us how many people were in their group. So they weren't, they weren't deducting. They as weren't they, deducting as, as they were going back. Uh, yeah. and, and so we were like, oh, there's how five more. Yeah, there's okay, five there's five more. more. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then you get to a point where you're like, I haven't seen anybody in 10 minutes. I, I don't trust the information yeah. they gave me, so yeah. I'm assuming they're all gone. Yeah. But little did we know that there was just a slow straggler just a in the slow, back. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And they were avoiding the dust. Yep. And so we started to speed up. And then we came up on them at speed right. and they came up on us But if they speed. would have just done this out the window, you would right. have known that there was one rider behind you right. and, instead of five. Right. You know what I mean? Or if that's the end, you know, you hold your fist or up. Or high. And, yeah, or high. You know, it's just, <laughs> these are just the little things that I think are really helpful to any, any novice rider. Right. You know right. what I mean? Uh, these, I, well, the littlest things can be the biggest things, if not. Well, it could save somebody's a, life. Right. Right. That, exactly. that one thing could save somebody's life. And that's, Or multiple know, people's lives. Absolutely. You know, we're, you know, especially in that circumstance, you've got a 15, 1800 pound machine against a kid on a 50 pound bicycle right. and himself. You know what I mean? They're, they have no protection. They have no cage. They have no seat belts. Yep. Hopefully they have a helmet, helmet yeah. on, but you know, outside of well, that. Well, and we none. even came up on, and shortly after those adventure bikers that we were on the Washington trail with, uh, right after the, right after them somewhere, we came up across a horse riding group. Yeah. And they have just as equal right to be there. 100%. And I, and I encourage anyone that hasn't ridden horses to go do so. It's an awesome time. Yeah. But when you have, an, they had some inex, inexperienced young women with them on the ho these big, massive yep. horses. And all of a sudden, these big, nasty, loud machines mm -hmm. to them come around the corner, throwing up a bunch of dust yep. and whatever. Yep. Uh, it spooks the horses. And these girls needed, their, their guides had to get off their horses, control these yes. young girls' horses. Even though we were well back away from them, mm -hmm. uh, it do, to an animal, that's a whole unpredictable story. Yeah. And that, that girl could have been kicked off the side of the right. hill, right? And so we just have to be aware of those and little things. And respectful And as respectful, well. yeah. yeah. And absolutely. give them their time. Don't try to creep up on them. And like, just give them, give them time yeah. and space. And Another thing I'd like to note on, too, is keep your trash in your car. You know what I For mean? For sure. I, I, was just, I just I, took a sacket off the razor uh, yesterday, and I was like thinking about you know, trail cleanup and yep. spring's coming up and we're, we're looking at yep. getting back out on yep. the trails and maybe doing some efforts to help keep the trails clean for the people that haven't thought about that. Well, the problem with it is you've got people that are tossing whatever out the window or, you know, something falls out or they wreck their vehicle and they don't clean up. Um, that's just gives the groups, the environmental groups, BLM, your forest service, just, hey, yeah, that's more, what's more, happening in Mount yeah, Moab. Yeah, They're yeah, using it as a, yeah, an option to just one more nail in the coffin. Yeah. And, and so if we could just do our part and keep the trails clean. And if you see trash, pick it up. Yeah. I mean, we do that when I go out. I'll, if I see something, I'll throw it, my, throw it on my razor and, and away I go. You right. know what I mean? But that's one thing that, that would and is affecting our industry. And I, don't, and, and I want to be able to ride. I want to yeah. be able to ride all the roads that we have here and all the trails we have here and that yeah. kind of stuff. But if we're not doing our part as, as people and keeping the trash, you know. And it's not even just that you put the trash in the razor, it's that you put it in the trash, in the razor responsibly. Correct, not like, so it just blows out of the back or right. whatever. You know, or if you're slick rock crawling yep. and, and you tumble over and yep. your, all your beers and all your yep. stuff goes all over the place, like take the time to pick it all up. The other thing that, I, the other thing that I've noticed was like, we were in St. Anthony last year and we stopped um, at the top of Choke Cherry. And if anybody's ever been up Choke Cherry, it's like 47 degrees and it's 800 feet long or something like that. So burnt belts. I, we sat up there and I mean, I must have picked up five whole belts. Right. You know, just people left their belts just sitting there, you know, and they, that bothers me to death. You know what I mean? Be responsible. Yeah. The people don't realize that 
there's not like a forestry team of people that go out with <laughs> got some hoses <laughs> trying to attack me over here. Um, there's not like a team of people at the forestry service that's job is to go rake the dunes no. or to go sweep the trail. Yeah. Like, like they'll do, they'll do some stuff because that's just part of their job yeah. like to, to maintain these things. But they're not out cleaning up after you. And the more trash they get, the more less, the less likely they are to be kind and courteous to having you in their area. Yeah, just like that, your house. You're not gonna leave your trash at someone's house yeah. and expect them to be happy to have you back. Yeah, I mean that desert, every time I go to the dunes somewhere else, it's like, why, why do I pull up to a, a place where we all are deciding to camp and there's broken glass and, and right. cans and, and just random trash bags hanging out, you know? like. That it's just that's the responsible and that's part of being a community and if you're gonna be in the community, just take responsibility for yeah. yourself. And and just not being in such a hurry to to one party mm -hmm. and two to to get back home and, and get back to work. Yeah. Like uh, the thing I see is a lot of people will leave last minute on Friday yeah. and they'll hurry out on Sunday to get back to yeah. home for Monday morning, work whatever, and they won't even touch the, the trailer or anything until like Thursday yeah. and like they're just always in a hurry mm -hmm. to push it to the, the time limit. And, and part of the best thing about this is getting outside and slowing down and enjoying and smelling and breathing. Yeah. And I think we need to encompass that, the entire planning of the trip. Yeah, like you got, you know, you had a week or two weeks to three weeks to plan this trip. You know, most of us aren't just off the cuff and that's just like a local ride. But if you're going somewhere, you know, take that time pre-plan. Right. And make sure you have the proper facilities to dispose of things and that you're prepared. You know, you take an extra belt with you, you, you take extra water with you on the, you know, in your cooler, don't just fill yeah. it full of, of beer. And so one know. thing that people don't think about is, is you can take something out in packaging, mm -hmm. but when you consume that thing and you have to manage a bunch of black glass bottles yep. or a bunch of cans or whatever, like how are you going to transport that back yeah. at that point? Right. Um, if you do a, a bonfire at night and you burn up all the boxes and bags that you mm -hmm. put, everything in on the way out, then how's stuff going to get back, right? Correct. Um, and so one of the things I've adopted is kind of a policy of if it doesn't fit in the cooler, mm -hmm. it doesn't go. Yeah. Right. Because if, if it fits in the cooler, it's going to fit on the way back. Correct. Right. Um, and so. But if you're taking a 30 rack out and you only, you know, right. <laughs> it's, it's already open. So now, you, you know, yeah. So that anyways, I mean, I don't want to harp on people too much, but it is definitely something that we're seeing a lot of. of and especially in local writing areas where yeah. it's like it's easy to ignore it because there's so many people out there that yeah. you just can slough it off as like it's their problem. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, but we when we did the Idaho BDR, we were up in the middle of nowhere. We're up by Frank Church or we're up by um, a lot of these different places. It's like you still see trash. Yeah. And it's like nobody travels this trail except for maybe no. once every three months. Yeah. And there's still trash there. Yeah. And and so we got to be better stewards of that. And it, otherwise, we're going to lose it. Yeah. Um, but uh, just to get off the, the sore subjects, um, yeah, so this Pro-R, what are you excited about? What are you, are you gonna be taking any trips with it here soon? Or Well, we're hoping to, hoping to have it completed by um, the Oregon event. That will be, that's mid to end June. of June yep. sometime. So I think that is our, I think that's our set goal. For kind getting- proving ground? Yeah, for proving ground, take it out there. Um, you know, obviously we've got to get a little bit of riding in before, before that happens. So it'll just be our local trails around right. here and, and, and being, you know, kind of beating on it a little bit. Um, I'm just excited to see the progression of that platform and the things that, you know, not only we can do, but the industry can do to make it perform better for the end user. Right. I mean, these are not cheap machines, right. you know, you, you, you have the machine, you're either paid for it in cash or you're financing it. Um, so it's a, it's a big payment. Um, so the parts that you want to put on or modify or change, not to say you can't just buy one and use it, um, but you're going to come up through the, through the process of owning a vehicle and, and want to change. And, and I think for us, all the th I already know what I want to do to the machine, but then what else progresses off of that? You right. know what I mean? I think that's more what I'm excited for because I already know the basics. The interesting right? thing I was thinking on the way over here um, was you look at like an XP1000, an XP Turbo, uh, Can-Am Maverick DS or a Commander or something like that. The, the machines are, I don't want to say cheap, but they're, they're less expensive than the, the new options, right? Correct. And there's this kind of feeling of like, if I break that thing, it's only going to send me back a little bit to replace it yeah. or to do a little bit of upgrades or whatever. Um, but now we're talking about, like you said, 42,000, 
forty-eight thousand uh, yeah. dollars for yeah. these cars. Yeah. I mean, we're we're talking about a decent truck at that point <laughs> as yeah. far as monetary value. Well, right? not anymore. I mean, uh, well, it's not yeah, in our market. Yeah, it used, to, it used to be, but <laughs> I, but uh, but I, I just I was thinking about the the idea that these were affordable enough that we could uh, not feel so bad about breaking components. Yep. But now that these are now ten, twenty thousand dollars more, yep. we're now in a point of buying components that last longer and are more targeted to what we want to do versus just throwing money at the car. Yeah, because I, I know a lot of people that have started, you know, builds and they buy, you know, the, the most cost effective part that they can find and then they end up breaking that part, warranting it out. Uh, Brent Gilliam is actually a, <laughs> Getting is actually, called out, Brent. Is actually a good, uh, good proponent of that. But um, I think having something that's built to a standard, especially for like the pro our machine like it's so heavy yeah that you can't just you can't just use the same tactics that you used on a machine that's five eight hundred pounds lighter yeah um you can't use the same materials you can't use the same heim joints you can't use there's so many things you've got to look at wall thickness on on tubing you've got to look at so many different different things that, uh, even something like still. thread size or something yeah, like that yeah. on a component can make a big difference absolutely the the strength component of a thread size on a Heim. I mean, go from half inch to five eighths is a huge, huge difference in, right. in strength. So, you know, um, those are the things that we've been looking at and talking about and kind of uh, pre-planning me and me and uh, my, my crew um, to see how or what it's gonna take to actually build a component to stand up to this car versus what it took to stand up to a, a Turbo S or, or a Can-Am or, right. you know, something along those lines that just don't weigh as much. There's just not as much car. Right. So I, I'm excited. I think that the cars themselves are always awesome to see progression and technology. And you know, now that the, the live valve uh, components on those shocks are now both uh, compression and rebound, yep. you know, is a huge deal. People don't really pay attention to that. Yep. The DV system on that car is gonna be amazing yeah. uh, once uh, all the tuning stuff comes Correct. out for them and stuff like that. Um, and uh, the car itself just being bigger and taller and stronger and longer. Well, yeah, um, getting into that car. I mean, I'm five foot eight, right? And I, I'm getting into that pro, and I got to like stretch my whole leg up. It's like getting into a big old lifted, you know, pickup. So, you know. So how long until we see the first side by side with the pop down? Oh yeah, step some, some some amp steps on it. That'd, that'd maybe, be, <laughs> maybe we should just do that. Piss people off. Yeah, maybe that'll be the the first thing we come out with. <laughs> But yeah, they are getting a lot bigger. And then, you know, a lot of guys are running, you know, you're going from the 32 stock to a 35, you know, and then some guys are going to go bigger than that, you know, especially yeah. the rock crawling guys. So, yeah. um, I don't it'll know. Be, it'll be interesting because like in like King of Hammers, it wasn't what a year or two ago where 35s and the UTVs was like mind blowing. Yeah. And those guys all won. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what's to say that the next year or two doesn't be 37s, yeah. 39s. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, hopefully the components will hold up to that abuse and that's something that we have to look at when we're building that component because I don't nine times out of ten I don't know the person buying the product they're right. buying it off of either our website or or one of our good retailer websites and you know I don't know if they're going to go put 37s on it or put a you know some crazy tire on it or some right. weird offset or whatever so you have to build it based on worst case scenario right and I think that we as buyers uh, should pay attention a little bit more to the capability of these products and what their intended use is. Uh, a lot of companies don't do a good job of explaining that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, as far as my, my segment of the market, as far as uh, educational materials yeah. and entertainment materials and, and informational videos, things like that, we can do a good job of that, but we can't like just go through every product and like test it out and then tell you what the limits are. Mm -hmm. You have to have a little bit of faith in what the manufacturer is saying. Yeah. Um, and so I put a little ownership on the manufacturers to, to kind of correctly verbalize and not just throw marketing speak at the consumer. Yeah, there, I mean, you can't, you can't expect a, a thin wall arched, you know, radius rod to, to, you know, work with a set of five inch portals and, you know, 35s. Right. And, and uh, not bend at some point during a, you know, it's whatever they're an doing. An impact event. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's usually an impact event. And nine times out of 10, this impact event is a dude spinning Brody's in his driveway and smacks <laughs> a curb. You know what I mean? Right. So, um, so th there are some limitations of some of those things. And, and you know, the majority of, of the products that, that we're going to build for the new R are going to be substantially different than the parts right. that we're doing for, say, a regular, you know, 
64 wide XP1000. So now when we talk about the Pro R and then Turbo R mm -hmm. that is going to start shipping within the next few months or whatever, uh, do you have a different mindset between the two cars? Or are they kind of about the same playing field? Well, the front. I mean, you don't have one yet. I don't okay. have one. So I, you know, and I've never seen one. So I don't. I don't know. You know, obviously nobody's really seen that car unless it's people in the media. Unless it was the know. two at Hammers that broke. Yeah. You know. Um, <laughs> I would say not much is going to change in my opinion. I mean, the you know, it, there's going to be they'll be a little bit lighter. They'll be lighter, not much lighter actually. If you look at the weights, they're they're it's like but a lot of those components are the suspension components, yeah, right? Yeah, it's the shocks and yeah. the arms, the what's up, the yeah, trailing the, arms. Yeah, and then the the engine weight is going to be lighter, but I believe it was only like a hundred pounds difference between the the turbo the R, R and, and the turbo R. R. Yeah, yeah. So it's mostly it, in the suspension. It didn't seem like it was that much different in weight. So I don't know that the components are going to change. Obviously, there's going to be some difference because the back half of that car is different. Um, so your trailing arm is going to is is different. I'm assuming the radius rods are probably going to be the same, but I haven't seen that car yet, so I don't know. I don't know that much of my, I, I think if it's going to work on the, the Pro, I'll take whatever we learn from that to, and to just carry it, it over. Yeah, to put it to the turbo. You know, I, I don't, beyond the length of the trailing arm, I think that's going to be the biggest difference, you know? So, so looking at 22, uh, we're pretty early in the year. I like to get people's perspective about what they're looking forward to, what, what they're excited about. Uh, we had the big Pro R launch this last fall. Uh, that finally came out a year late and all that stuff. Uh, we haven't really heard anything from other manufacturers of new cars coming out. We have some rumors and stuff like that, but we don't really expect anything game changing over the next year or Not so. Groundbreaking. Um, so, as far as a manufacturer or even just you personally, what are you looking forward to this year, uh, event wise, product wise, car wise, travel wise? Truly, I think, you know, after coming out of the, the second you know out of the second year of the pandemic you know what i mean and, and people you know it's this industry is a little bit different you know people have been out and doing things um i think i'm just more excited to get out to the rest of the you know to the country and to see people and to, to be you know be a part of the community be a part more. of the community more i think you know going out to take over in um in at san hollow was like it was a that was a big deal for me that was kind of like the coming out you know um, not just for Deviant, just for the industry as a, as a whole of, you know, like, hey, we're all going to be okay, you know? And the prior year before that, I just felt like we were, everybody was just so landlocked and, and stay home and don't do anything. And uh, almost I'm like just, a depressed, yeah, a depression. And then, yeah. And, and I, I was depressed during that time, yeah. to be honest. Like, I, you know, I didn't have a whole lot to look forward to. And so this year it's more about enjoying what I have enjoying the, the, you know, the fruits of, of my labors um, and taking my family out and doing some of these events, you know, right. taking my wife and my, and my two-year-old out, and out and experiencing what we're doing, you yeah. know what I mean? And being, and that also gets me back into the roots of the culture, you know right. what I mean? Of, of actually enjoying the outdoors, enjoying the, the parts that we make, but also the machine um, and the camaraderie that we get from other, you know, riders and, right. and, and enthusiasts. Like, I think that's, I think that's the most thing that I'm looking forward to this year events. I'm looking forward to events. I'm looking forward to getting out to, uh, to the takeovers and, and, and to a different, a couple of different events this year, um, to just to see what, you know, what is coming up, you yeah. know what I mean? To, to, to just give me something to look forward to. So you went to Utah. That was your first time in Utah, right? No, or, I actually, I was, I was born in Utah and I've been oh. to San Hollow, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was uh, wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not my, it was not my first time in San Hollow either. I actually rode quads at San Hollow in the 2000s, oh. right? The you know, 2004, three, four, five. 2005. Um, so it was definitely, it was just my first experience in the rocks. Gotcha. Because before it was sand paddles and out in the dunes, which isn't very big They're dunes. not very big, yeah. Um, but it was just more of, that was just a family experience and everybody go out ride ride four-wheelers and right. stuff like that, you know, pre-UTV stuff. Um, but... I kind of forgot what question but, you but I like for me going to San Hollow for the first time two years ago yeah was kind of like a different like click in the brain of yeah. like what's out there yeah like I'm so used to traversing trails and mountains and valleys and yep. and all that stuff it's a whole different experience when you go out to the San Hollow and you go out to the out top of the world and you can see this terrain that just doesn't exist mentally in your head yeah up the here expanse in the of the yeah. expanse of the 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 Southwest is completely different riding, completely different experience. You know what I mean? It's, it's, 
there's a piece to being in the woods mm -hmm. and there's a piece to being in the desert too. Yep. And that's what I felt like being at the top of the world was, that was so cool. You know what I yeah. mean? I, I, that was one place I'd never been. It was, that was a, that rock crawling experience was such a enlightening experience to me to, to, to see the one, the culture of the people there. And then, you know, see the new guys like myself out there and, and the camaraderie that was there with not just my group that was riding, but the groups that were in the same areas and doing things and talking and, you right. know, us videoing them do, doing cool stuff. And, and yeah, I, I really enjoyed the time there and watching the different kind of builds that people had because we really get kind of focused on the, the area that we're in. You right. know what I mean? Yep. And that brought to light a whole different set of problems, issues, right. and hopefully new, you know, new well, parts. And it's like when I went to, when I was on the Idaho BDR, and we started down in the, the Nevada, Idaho border. Um, you know, there's some cool like canyony features down in Southern Idaho, yeah. Nevada area. Yep. But once you get into that middle, like lower mm -hmm. Idaho area, it's like all just sagebrush and yep. desert and yep. farmland and stuff. It's like super boring. Yeah. And but I would have never known that I didn't want to ever do that again unless I had done it once. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I, I, when I went to Utah and I saw all these other options, like desert doesn't just mean an open barren yeah, just, land. Just sagebrush and, and right. you know, I, I, I've spent a lot of time in Utah, Nevada. I lived in Nevada for 20 years, was born in Utah. My parents and my whole family are from Utah. So you're just slowly migrating to Canada. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> If anybody's ever been to Coeur d'Alene or, or this area, you'll understand why I'm here. It's yeah, yeah. God's country up yeah, there. Yeah. So it's beautiful here. But yeah, experience and all that, like I kind of understand the the nothingness of the desert sagebrush, and then being out in Vegas and going to Red Rocks or going to to any of the places around there and seeing those different riding conditions. There was a lot of rock crawling that was happening, you know, and back then, right, uh, in those areas. So I did get to see that and. Uh, experience it but then coming up here and seeing the the different mountain mountainous riding that we do and um it's just a whole new experience i've never been to the east coast to, to ride so that would be something that i would like to do sometime this year having gone to uh virginia last year mm -hmm. and seeing kind of what's out there on those trails in virginia and, and those areas uh while limited because of private ownership and things yeah. like that the, the areas that are open yeah there's some pretty awesome riding out there and it, it's not it's not like fast riding yeah it's like a hybrid between the northwest trails mm -hmm. and rock crawling, rock crawling of, yeah. of the desert like it's this weird intersection of like you're surrounded by green it's in your face the whole time yeah. but you're crawling up crawling, yeah and i've watched all the videos on that and it looks really interesting and exciting to do you yeah. know that'd be something that i would like to do it's not point. with a 12 foot pro not, no not not with the school bus that i have in the back yeah. no that would definitely not be the ride of choice for yeah. those for those conditions but right i think i think that car would be it's going to be an amazing desert car i think that yeah. is going to be the biggest and i think that's exactly who they targeted it yeah. to so it'd be an amazing desert car it'll be an amazing dune car um you know the open expanses that's the best the best car not car but like UTV. that's the best use for that yeah for that platform you know what i mean for up here i don't know what it is i want to see the turbo r just because of its length difference i know they're still wide but even when you had a 72 wide you know turbo s you were putting wheels on it and making it wide i mean my car was 80 inches yeah um, and I didn't have any problems up here with that, but having the length is the difference. And, yeah. you know, I've got several friends that have the, the, uh, the pros, um, and they work well up here in the four yep. seat platform, but that car is just really big. Yeah. No, yeah. the, the turning radius on that's going to probably just be God awful on, if you measure it out. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, looking forward to spring yeah, right around the too, corner. Man. We had looking our, we to... had our annual fake spring a week ago. Uh, yep. Um, and then it went down to the twenties. <laughs> it was like and... negative four at my yeah, house. Oh my last gosh. Week. It was bad. Um, and so we're in our second winter, but that'll go away soon. We'll be back out on the trails. Yeah. Uh, we talked a little bit about maybe going out and doing some yeah. riding. Yeah. Um, that'll be fun. Uh, and uh, looking forward to putting some new parts on the car and, yep. and seeing how they do. Yep. Um, pushing that car around a little bit harder than we're used to doing. Yeah, and we um, have a few other options for you on that for turbochargers and upgrade uh, right. control so arms and stuff like that. That's right. Something I so. haven't covered is that you guys have your own turbo upgrades. We do, yeah. Um, you got your own blow off valves, I think, that you yeah. build here. Charge tubes. Um, all that stuff. Yep. So yeah, you we know, have. that might be something we have to investigate and, yeah. and see what happens. So yep. uh, looking forward to this year. This year is going to be. Uh, a big year for me content wise, we're gonna be pushing out a lot of content, hoping to connect with people at events and brands and mm -hmm. stuff that we just want to support. So anyways, you can find Deviant Race Parts where? It's DeviantRaceParts.com, it's our website. 
We're on uh, Facebook, and we're on, uh, we have a YouTube channel, and we also do uh, in, our Instagram, Instagram and so, all that stuff. So. Yeah, so the basic socials, uh, we're pretty, pretty on that. And then if you want to catch me on my personal page, it's at Chadwick, Chadwick Von Hall. <laughs> Um, and I do just random videos inside the shop here and stuff like that on reels. Um, we have a few other guys here too. So, yeah. yeah. So you can find the podcast on Spotify, YouTube, Apple podcasts, all the different places you can find us on YouTube. If you like to watch people like Chad's lovely face here, uh, we uh, know Brent's at home, uh, caressing his screen right now, uh, kissing on his face. <laughs> so, um, shout out to Brent, uh, shout out to all our listeners that have followed us through the years. Uh, we look forward to 2022, getting out to the events and seeing everybody. Uh, you can find us online. You can find us on social. You can subscribe. You can give us a like. You can rate our podcast, all those things. And we appreciate you when you do. So until the next time, guys, peace.